Hi everyone, my name is Sunny. Thank you for being here today. I know it's the last session of QIP. Um, today I want to briefly talk about quantum locally testable codes with constant soundness. This is highly related to the results from the two previous talks we heard in this session. And I wish to bring some new results to you. So this is joint work with Andrew Cross, Anand Natarajan, Mario Sagadi, and Guan Yu Zhu. So let me start by defining the problem that we're studying and kind of describing the situation. And let me very quickly go over some definitions like the linear code. So an n-bit linear code uh, on n bits, um, over this talk we'll be working over the binary field F2, is defined by a parity check matrix H such that an n-bit word X it's in the code space C if H of X equals to zero. So in this case, you should think of H as um, a every row of H is a check. And H of X being zero simply means that X passed all the checks. And H of X, we call it the syndrome of X. If it has no syndrome, it means it's a code space. Uh, it means it's in the code space. So there are a few parameters we care about, and I want to just define it quickly for this talk, because we will compare and contrast them. One parameter we care about is the dimension of the code space. And sometimes we'll also define the rate as the dimension over n. This is the number of logical bits that your code is encoding. Um, you also care about the distance, which is the minimum weight of the code words. It tells you how well protected your information is. And the locality, and now locality is defined in a lot of different places, but locality in this talk is going to be the minimum weight of any row or column of H, and it captures the idea of how sparse the matrix H is. And in principle, we want constant locality. So when is a code locally testable? Well, a code C is locally testable with soundless row if for any n-bit word X, we have on the left-hand side, you have this weight of the syndrome over M, so you should think of it as the relative syndrome weight. On the right-hand side, you have the distance of X from the code space over N. So you should think of it as the relative distance uh, multiplied by this factor rho. So what is this equation really saying? It's saying that if your state, or if X, is far from the code space, um, and for instance, a large error has happened on your code, then um, the number of violated checks should be proportionally large, which means you can just sample random checks out of H and should be easy to detect that such an error has happened. Okay? So that's a condition of local testability in a classical sense. And we say that a code is a C cubed LTC if it has constant rate, locality, soundness, and linear distance. So basically all the best properties that you would hope for in a classical code. Okay, so let me, so what is a quantum code, a locally testable code? Well, I'll very quickly just talk about the CSS definition right there. You know, you're defined by two parity check matrices, HX and HZ, to satisfy this orthogonality condition. And we're going to define the stabilizer code for each row R of HX. I'm going to define the X stabilizer, X to the R, which is simply the tensor product of all the matrices X to the RI, where x to the 0 is identity, x to the 1 is x, you know, this is simple. Now, you also define the z-stabilizer from the matrix HZ, and that gives you a stabilizer code. And the Hamiltonian of this code is going to be defined as follows, which is really based on all the stabilizer operators. So we say that a quantum stabilizer code is locally testable with soundness rho if it satisfies this equation, which says if you take the Hamiltonian and you divide it by the number of stabilizer operators, so once again, think of this as measuring the relative check, uh, relative syndrome. And on the right-hand side, you have D, which is the distance operator. Given a quantum state, you're going to measure how far away is it from a quantum code space. Once again, you divide it by N, multiply it by rho. And this is simply capturing the classical idea, generalizing to the quantum case, that if a large error happened on my code, uh, or happen on my state, then I should detect it, or, or the local testability property is going to allow me to detect it more easily by sometimes just sampling random checks. Okay? Cool. So that's a quantum LTC. And why do we even study these objects? You know, um, theoretically speaking, classical locally testable codes have been important applications in classical probabilistically checkable proofs. The, these kind of classical PCP results heavily make use of these classical LTCs. And the quantum notion of PCP, which is mentioned this morning in the NLTS talk, has been defined and is still very open. And we hope, we don't know, this is an open question, that these quantum LTCs can help with the study of quantum PCP. Okay? Also, you know, quantum LTC is kind of an 
one of the natural follow-ups to the breakthrough work on these asymptotically good QLDPC codes, by, you know, first of all, firstly by Pantalea Kalashev, but also Lorenzo Moore and the talk we just heard. Also, and on the C-cube LTCs, which is by Denor et al., and also by Ling and co-authors, um, it's kind of a natural follow-up to these two lines of breakthrough work, because these works really demonstrated to us that local testability and these quantum LDPC code, asymptotically good ones, they share very similar flavor because their construction, you know, it makes use of the left right Cayley complex, which sometimes I like to call just the balanced product of classical codes. And, you know, it really brings forth the question of, are these constructions all related? You know, can we build like quantum LTCs? Okay. And further, quantum LTCs have pretty important applications in quantum complexity theory, as demonstrated by Aldar and Harrow in 2014, that if you have a quantum LTC of certain parameters, then it will imply the then open NLTS conjecture. Now we know NLTS has been solved. It's a serum using like these asymptotically good codes. However, quantum LTCs of those parameters have not been found, and we are still working on constructing them. Okay. Now, practically, the testability property itself might be of some interest. If a state experiences a large error, then sampling a constant fraction of the checks should give you some indication of how large the error is. And also, you know, the local testability property is not in itself an asymptotic property. Small codes can be LTCs too. Okay. So, all right, that's enough motivation. Let me quickly talk about the contributions of what we what we did in this work. Now. Quantum LTC is not a very, you know, widely studied subject. There's only two constructions before us that were known, one of them by Hastings and the other one by Lavier, Lond, and Zaymore. They're asymptotic codes based on geometric ideas, and our codes are built from combinatorial ideas that can construct both small and asymptotic codes, and our constructions are highly tweakable. So if I may direct your attention to the first column of this, uh, of this table, um, that kind of summarizes the parameters from a, from the previous works. Um, notably, they achieve a soundness of roughly 1 over log n, where capital N is the number of physical qubits. And they have logical qubits, usually 1 or 2, which is not great. But they have distance square root n, which is pretty good. And they have locality log n. Okay, so in this work, we present three constructions, all of which has constant soundness. And the first two constructions have, base, have linear distance. Now, if I may direct your attention to the first construction right here, it has constant locality, but has distance too, which is really, you know, not good for any purposes. However, and also, you know, this, this, you know, these sets of parameters are easily accomplish, accomplishable by other means. However, we're able to leverage this construction one. We're able to find ways to generalize and improve over these construction to get the next two constructions. Um, so I'll talk about what X means in a second. I think I haven't mentioned that. However, in this case, if we look at construction two, X can be taken to be any value, any value you pick from constant to linear. So construction two is really saying that you can achieve arbitrary distance, but you have to pay a, a price of having your locality scaling with your distance. And construction three, which is what we think is probably the most interesting construction from this work and will be presented at this talk, is that once again, you can achieve arbitrary distance and the sacrifice will be having a worst case locality of linear loca uh, scaling with x. And also you sacrifice some of the logical qubits. However, one interesting consequence of our construction is that the average locality in the third construction is going to be constant. Now let me warn you, average locality is not necessarily a useful measure. It's a natural consequence that just fall out of the construction that we think is interesting. And you know, initially we caught our paper quantum LTCs with exotic parameters. In this case, we use the words exotic in a completely neutral sense. But if you take x to be, say, log n or square root n, then you get some quantum locally testable codes with interesting parameters. And in this talk, we'll focus on the third construction, which we think the methods are interesting and maybe of future use. Okay? Cool. So let me get to like some high-level ideas of how the construction works. And let's start with somewhere very simple. 
Okay, a quantum code is CSS code. It's a quantum LTC with soundness rho. If non surprisingly, both of its component codes are constant, are classical LTCs of soundness rho. So the question really is, you know, if you take this perspective instead of, um, it's slightly different from the perspective presented in Link's work, where you consider these high dimensional expanders and you talk about boundary and co boundary expansion and chain complexes. You know, okay, our work essentially reduces to talking about chain complexes. But for now, let's think about constructing classical LTCs that are orthogonal. Okay? So here's a very simple start. Um, you take a classical LTC with soundness rho and some other parameters. You take the matrix H bar, which is really just two copies of the matrix H stacked side by side with each other. And you look at the code defined on this matrix, which really is just, if you want to express in a more algebraic way, it's all the words of the form XY, where X and Y are n bit strings, such as X plus Y, mod 2, again, we work over field of size 2, um, X plus Y is in the code word C. Then it's very easy to check that this, this matrix is self orthogonal. The question now becomes does this code have any kind of soundness guarantees? Because if you kind of work with local testability, work with soundness, and you know, try to operate on these codes, you realize that soundness is a very fragile property. So what we can show here, and it's not a long proof, but it has some insights, is that this is indeed a classical LTC with soundness two row and distance two. Okay, and naturally this gives rise to the quantum code, you know, with soundness two row and distance two. And, you know, if we take C to be a C cubed LTC, which we now know they exist, we have an interesting QLTC of linear rate, constant soundness, constant locality, but it has distance two, which is not good for basically any purposes. So the question is what now, right? You know, there are two approaches that we took to improve the distance and to build upon this construction. The first approach is to generalize the above construction of check matrix H bar, and that will give rise to this parameters in serum two in the table, which I'll show again. Another approach is to apply the distance balancing technique that's very notably def uh, developed by Hastings for these quantum codes. Now, what is distance balancing? Well, distance balancing set, if you now, for quantum CSS code, there's two distances. There's the x distance and there's the z distance, right? And if your x and z distance are different, imbalanced, then I can apply such a distance balancing technique to, at the sacrifice of some other parameters, make the two distances roughly scaling with each other. Okay, so we'll talk about this approach and what kind of geometric insights we need to really improve the distance of this quantum code. Okay, cool. So first of all, I have to modify the quantum code a little bit because you know distance balancing is applied to two codes with uh, to one code with x, different x and z distance. But in this construction right now, both distances is two. So the so the modification is very simple. You take the h x matrix as two copies of h. You take the h z matrix as a very simple matrix, just two copies of the identity matrix, and you take the quantum code. The interesting thing here is that the z distance is now linear, and the x distance is 2. So really, this is a scenario where you can apply distance balancing. And again, it's not surprising that it's still locally testable with soundness 2 row. Okay? So now let's try distance balancing and see what we get. Right? Um, what is, okay. More detailedly, what is distance balancing? Well, Hastings considered the hypergraph product of a quantum code and a classical repetition code of size L. If you don't know what hypergraph product mean, don't worry, I have a slide talking about it. I have the next slide talking about it. But very intuitively, um, uh, not, intuitive, not intuitively, but on a high level, Hypergraph product or homological product is the underlying technique, this very important method that's used in this whole line of constructions of these quantum LDPC codes from the early work uh, that shows that you know there you can achieve square root n distance to these fiber bundle codes, lifted product codes, balanced product codes. I can go on, but you know, all of these quantum LD asymptotically good quantum LDPC codes, they are really like based off of this idea and modification of this idea of hypergraph product. Okay. Uh, anyways, you consider the hypergraph product of a quantum code and a classical repetition code of size L. Now your dx is going to be improved by a factor of L, which is great. However, your soundness is going to decrease by a factor of L, and which is horrible because, and this is not surprising because classical repetition code, I mean, it's such a simple code. It has no soundness guarantee. It has a soundness guarantee of one over L and it's distance L. So this is really not very surprising, right? If you, okay. Now, the, the, 
the question is, how can we salvage this soundness? We want to build quantum codes with good soundness, and it seems like this kind of distance balancing approach just kills it from the start. Okay, so the question is, how can we modify this approach? And it turns out that the modification we need is um, conceptually very simple, but the proof is kind of a little bit involved. Um, so I'll just describe the conceptual part. Essentially, all you need to do is to use a different parity check matrix for the repetition code and I'll explain why that is. So let me first talk about what is hypergraph product very briefly using the Tora code example. If you consider a torus, it's really you take a circle a horizontal circle, replace each point on a horizontal circle with a vertical circle, and that gives you a torus. Similarly, in the Torah code example, where we have this lattice, this 2D grid lattice with periodic boundary, it's really just a product of two cyclic graphs. And now, um, it's a Torah code is the hypergraph product of two classical repetition codes. And a classical repetition code can be thought of as a cyclic graph, which I'll describe on the next slide. But essentially, hypergraph product is a very geometrical, homological idea. And when we really take the hypergraph product of two codes, for instance, a quantum code and a repetition code, I'm saying replace each qubit in my quantum code with now a cycle of qubits and I'm going to connect them in complicated ways, which I will not go into describing. Okay. This is like a two minute crash course on hypergraph product, but let's talk about repetition code and how we really achieve like constant soundness by changing just the parity check matrix. On the left hand side here, you see just a usual parity check matrix of the repetition code. And on the right hand side, it's nothing more than just a Gaussian elimination version of it. Um, it's the same code, it's just that you take a different parity check matrix. However, the left hand side, if you look at each column as a vertex in a graph, and each row as an edge, and you know, ones are placed on the vertices in that edge, then that really gives you a cyclic representation. And the right hand side really gives you a star representation. Okay? Once again, hypergraph product is a very geometric idea. And the point here is that the second form is going to have soundness one, locality, set of L, if you take L as the size of your repetition code because the last column is all ones, and average locality constant. And this is what I mean by, you know, it kind of fell straight out of our construction, it's just an interesting property. However, it turns out that by changing kind of the geometry of this code, we're able to preserve constant soundness. And let me summarize kind of our construction. You take C to be a C cube LTC. You take the CSS code defined by these two matrices that I described for you that give you a quantum code with unbalanced distance. You consider the hypergraph product with the repetition code in the star form. And you prove that the resulting code has soundness one. This is actually one of the main technical contribution of our work because you know, this is the first example of hypergraph product codes that kind of preserve the soundness of the component codes. If you, again, if you work with soundness, you will realize that's a very fragile property. And before this, it's kind of not obvious at all that hypergraph product should preserve any kind of soundness. However, by just doing this simple, like, changing geometry, instead of replacing each qubit with a cycle of qubits, I replace it with a star of qubits, this turns out to give us that the resulting code have constant soundness. A proof of this is quite technical and I'm not going to go into, but a, a note here is that, you know, this has average locality constant, which is not necessarily a useful measure. And the setback here is that the distance is once again going to scale with the worst case locality, just because the unfortunate fact that is that we use the classical repetition code. Okay, so the question now is, you know, can you replace the repetition code by some other codes? And that is ongoing, that's some ongoing question that we're thinking about right now. Let me put this table here again. Um, if you take x, can be again taken to be any value from constant to linear. And if you take it to be, say, log n and square root n, then these two constructions give you some parameters that may be interesting. Now, these parameters are not strictly better than prior work. Okay, the prior work has a good scaling of distance and locality, where they have square root n distance and log n locality. And we're working on trying to see if we can get a good scaling between distance and locality as well, by using like more complicated geometry than just the classical repetition code. So let me talk about a couple of open questions here. The first open question is obviously, do these C cubed quantum LDCs exist? You know, you want constant soundness, constant locality, linear rate, and linear distance. And you know, it's 
it's, it's, it's a big open problem that has some, that some of the best people working on. And the next question is, do quantum LTCs help with QPCP? This is even a more open-ended question because, you know, this morning, uh, Chime described this issue with, uh, local indistinguishability. And that is a problem that shows up in when you talk about these, um, error correcting codes. And it's completely unclear whether, you, you know, just quantum LTCs can help with quantum PCPs at all, like in the classical case. And third of all, you know, does these quantum LTCs have any practical usage of these testability property? And the fact that, you know, you can build small codes with this testability property as well. Okay, so these are all open questions, which some of them are very open-ended, some of them are very, and all of them are, I think, are very hard, but we are working on them, and yeah, thank you for your time. And I'll take some questions. Thank you. How do we do this? Yes. Set up. Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, I have more of a meta question on local testability in general. Um, mm -hmm. Like you said that, so the syndrome grows with the size of the flips that you make or the errors that happen. Um, so in the main use case that you mentioned was, okay, then I can pick kind of random samples from the checks that I do and still be able to get enough information out of it. But it reminded me a bit about um, confinement in like higher dimensional homological product codes where mm -hmm. you use it to have a single shot decodability. Ah. So I was wondering in general if there are more applications beyond the just random sampling of checks to get less checks and in particular if single shot falls into there or did I make like a, did I jump too fast? <laughs> or so I, I understand confused. your question of asking, you know, does this local testability property imply kind of single shot decoding or, or stuff like that? Yeah. Uh, that is not a question I have thought a lot about. Um, maybe Chris over there might know. Um, he has thought a lot about the single shot decoding. Yeah. My understanding is that, you know, local testability will give you single shot decoding, but you, you know, with your codes, you also, with these kind of LTCs, you also want like higher distance than just distance two to kind of make use of any kind of single shot property. Okay. Uh, sorry. Um, so maybe this is just like my, my own ignorance of the topic, but, um, I thought that in the classical case, like the existence of these locally testable classical codes was like directly related to the PCP theorem, yes. right? Yes. Um, but here you said it's not clear uh, whether the existence of like a, a, a quantum one would imply the quantum PCP theorem. Is there an easy way to see why this connection is not so direct in the quantum case as in the classical case? Well, in the classical case, the classical probabilistically checkable proofs are built using like these classical LTCs and I forgot the name of the codes used, but they're built using these classical LTCs um, in, in a very critical way. Now, the same approach has been tried with, you know, constructing these quantum probabilistically checkable proofs using quantum LTCs, and we don't know they exist yet. But again, one of the issues with using like quantum codes in this PCP, just a bit of intuition, is this issue with local indistinguishability. That if you have a high distance code, then locally your code words, you know, lo lo looks like the same. Which is mentioned uh, this morning in the NLTS talk. So, like on a very high level, that is kind of why the connection is not immediately clear. Like, it's not like if you have like these amazing quantum LTCs that would just give you constructions of QPCP. That's not the case. Okay, thank you. Other questions? So, so you mentioned that um, your main technical result was showing that like the balanced product preserved uh, like soundness. 
Yes. So like, what happens if you take the balanced product of two like C cubed LTCs, like classical LTCs? Yeah. So, so that is a very natural question that we first thought of. You know, suppose you replace the repetition code with anything that is smarter, like a expander code. You know, that's or or a C cube LTC or you know these hypercubic chain complexes. Like because this result is really just a manipulation of the chain complex and its you know boundary and co-boundary operators. Um, we 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 do get into problems, and by by now we have summarized kind of a short list of the conditions that we really need for the component to replace the repetition code with anything else. We kind of summarize a list of conditions that we need, and just expander graphs or expander codes themselves are not going to work. And we don't think that these cubed LTCs at the moment is going to work with what we understand. Thanks. Yeah, but we, we are investigating this. Anything else? We can, yeah. Oh. I propose uh, I mean, we can leave. We can stick around for a five-minute discussion. Maybe all the speakers can come here. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, so my question is, uh, I think your first result or first starting point was a quantum LTC with distance 2, right? Yes. And uh, from what I remember, if, I mean, the, this lo local testability is defined like in the case when uh, the input is far from being in the code and you want to test like uh, whether it's a code, like whether it's a code board is far or it's far from the code. But when distance is two, I, I don't really understand how, how this like notion of local disability is defined because I mean, you can change two like elements and like stay in the code by, by just converting it to another code board, right? Yeah, so that is actually one of the most com common questions we got on this work is that, you know, how can you have a meaningful notion of local testability when the code distance is two? And the answer to that is that while the, the distance of two means that, you know, there are Way two logical operators. However, you can still have a non-trivial and a large error to happen, though either X error or Z error, to happen on your code space that's going to take your code state very far from the code space. Like the distance of a uh, quantum state from the code space can still be, say, linear. And that is kind of justified with our modification uh, over here, that if you just change the matrix a little bit, you immediately recover, for instance, the z distance being linear while one set of distance being two. Um, the logical operators of this quantum code, uh, be the modified version of the unmodified version, is very, has a very clear structure, and it does allow, say, like very high weight errors from happening, and therefore the local testability to come into effect. Thanks. Uh, thanks, all the speakers in the session.